Okay, so I'm nervous to give this year, okay, because, um, so let, let's go back around here, right? So we, at the Shabbaton, I talked about how uh, we poskin that you can have multiple Rav Muhaks, right? In terms of, so let's say like, so for me, Rav Mokhut is my Rav Muhak in Mishle, okay? Rav Pesach is my Rav Muhak in Gemara. And Rav Muhak is defined as the one who is responsible for your current level of Chachma in that area, you know? Um, so... Rabbi Sachs, so Rabbi Yoni Sachs, who was one, he was second generation YBT, uh, if, depending on how you count the generations, you know, like he, he was from Pittsburgh, but he was from Pittsburgh, after, he didn't have Rabbi Moskowitz as a high school Rebbe. Uh, so meaning like Rabbi Fox and Leslie Unger and Dave Markowitz and like Robbie Schwartz and like those guys had Rabbi Fox, uh, had Rabbi Moskowitz as a high school Rebbe. And then Rabbi Fox and all the guys went to YBT and then Rabbi Sachs was like next, you know? So Rabbi Sachs was, you know, so there, you know, it's crazy how like, you know, you, your paths cross with one person and that like changes your life, you know? So Rabbi Sachs was in Far Rockaway for one year and it, I didn't know him. I was friends with Yehuda Rapport, who was one of his primary Tommy Din, Yehuda Rapport and, and Rabbi Maruf. And like, I was at a Kiddush, the first Kiddush in Yeshiva of the summer, like Yeshiva hadn't started yet. And I happened to walk by and Yehuda was going to be learning with Rabbi Sachs and Yehuda said, I'm not feeling well, like, why don't you and Johnny go learn with Rabbi Sachs? So we learned Rabbi Sachs, and then that started this thing where we learned with Rabbi Sachs every morning after Hanitz for the whole year, and he was my, became my Chumash Rebbe. He introduced me to Rabag, he introduced me to Rambam as non-brister, like as a non-brister, like Rambam as Torah system, and I kind of forgot this until I was preparing this year, he introduced me to Bruce Lee. And I don't even remember how. All I remember is it was either something he wrote or something he said or a book that he had. Somehow he introduced me to Bruce Lee. So that was note number one. And note number two was Johnny sent me a video of Bruce Lee, which you can find on the internet. It's a famous thing. The, there are the very few interviews with Bruce Lee. Black and white interview, 38 seconds, okay? And Bruce Lee, what he would do is he would, uh, you know, he didn't get a chance to make that many movies uh, where he was like in control of it and it was in English. But the movies he did, he 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 tried to get in as much of his philosophy as possible into the movies, and he did it in like individual scenes. And so, so the guy in the interview asked him to recap like a certain line. So he says uh, he says it was something like this. That's what he said. That's not me saying that. It was something like this. He says, "Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless like water. Uh, you pour water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You pour water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You pour water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash." Be water, my friend. And somehow I needed to hear that at that moment and it hit me. And then that's what started me on Bruce Lee. And what happened was this was when I started, this is when I became a teacher. Okay. So I was learning, I was, I was in graduate school for teaching and this, inter, my Rabbi Sachs experience was the last year I was in yeshiva. And then Bruce Lee was the year after that, or that summer actually. And I started reading Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee became my Rav Muhak in, uh, in teaching. And all of my approach to teaching, I mean, obviously I had great teachers like Rabbi Moskowitz and Rabbi Zach and like Rafe Zach, you know, uh, but like my whole approach to teaching became like was forged in the furnace of Bruce Lee throughout the summer and through that first year and like onward. And then that affected my learning. And and so like, so in, in, my, in my graduate school, like valedictorian speech, when I gave my thank yous, like I thanked like Bruce Lee and like everyone like laughed. And I was like, no, I'm serious, you know, like, you know, and like I explained like what Bruce Lee did. And I, th I think the thing I actually meant to start off with this is like Bruce Lee, people think of him as a martial artist or as an actor. I have never seen a Bruce Lee movie, okay? He was a philosopher and he actually is a Seattle guy. I mean, there's some like identification. I, I didn't find out about this until afterwards. He's a, he is a Seattle guy. He's also, uh, I had to explain to someone today that I'm not Chinese. Revelation. <laughs> According in Hawaii, I'm not Chinese. I'm called Hapa, which means a half breed uh, because I am, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, uh, because my dad is uh, white and my mom is Chinese, you know, Bruce Lee was also a Hapa, you know, um, and so like there's like there's some identification psychological thing going on, but I didn't discover that until after I was reading his teachings. Um, uh, obviously, tragically, Bruce Lee died young. Anyone know how young he died? It's insane. 32. Died 32 of brain aneurysm. Perfectly physically healthy. Out of nowhere, obviously there are many conspiracy theories, you know, and like it's also tragic because his son Brandon Lee was was also killed tragically young, uh, shot. On, it was on the set of uh, the, the crow. yeah the crow, 
and it was supposed to be a fake gun like you have when you're shooting movies and it was a real gun and he just got shot in the scene and he died like you know so like <laughs> yeah i mean th yeah that, that like that there's more basis for that you know um so um so bruce lee though in my mind is primarily a philosopher and the reason why i like him is to me the essence of bruce lee is he was a master of craft which means that any craft whether it's teaching or martial arts or like like you know or like you know basketball or like you know calligraphy whatever it is he was a master at how to become a master of the craft and when he wrote about martial arts he wrote about it in that way and that's how i was able to like take what he wrote and apply it to teaching because he was a teacher obviously he was a martial arts teacher but he was a master at articulating his teachings in a way where like um where uh where you can extrapolate from it and use it in other areas and the two things he did to martial arts for for martial arts well three things he did for martial arts was number one he introduced it to hollywood in a serious way meaning that he was the only one who or the first one who actually was a serious martial artist and actually used real martial arts in movies in in in, in hollywood instead of just like stage stuff secondly is martial arts were a um were an exclusive club and it was like utter if you were a Chinese practitioner of a certain style of martial arts, it was utter for you to teach people outside of that sect, especially Westerners, especially white people. And he democratized it and made it available to anyone. And then the biggest thing he did was he created Jeet Kune Do. So Jeet Kune Do is his style, but it's a, it's a non-style style. And the logo or the symbol of it is, is this, uh, which is using no way as way and using no limitation as limitation. Uh, and it was a style which is predicated on the dissolution of styles. That his his theory is basically that all of these um, forms of martial arts were based on like specific styles with specific techniques. So, for example, when I was in middle school, I trained in a, in a style of kung fu called the bakwa or bagua, which was all based on circles. You know, and the whole idea yeah. was that someone throws like a punch at you, and you deflect it with a circle motion. So like that's very effective. However, if you're in a situation where you can't use your arms, then it's not very effective, you know? So so like, and let's say like you have kickboxing. So kickboxing relies on the legs. But if like, if your whole style is about your legs, then you're closing yourself off to other techniques. So his whole style with Jeet Kune Do is based on using, is efficiency is whatever strikes or whatever works. And using whatever, taking the best out of all the techniques and then not being, and then having the mentality of not being bound by any technique, you know, and um, and that's where that's why Bruce Lee is considered the father of mixed martial arts of MMA. MMA is huge now, but that was you gotta understand like that was taboo, and it was viewed you would be viewed as like an ignoramus, like simple thing. Like if you're mixing like kickboxing and like karate, like what are you doing? Like you're polluting the purity of like the the art. You're like like drawing. You're you're crossing lines, and like you're not doing. But Bruce Lee was was you know wanted to create a style of, uh, of 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 no style, you know. And the other thing is that um, that like it opened up new possibilities in terms of finish in particular martial arts because if you're only like in a certain style, your mind is conditioned to think in certain ways. But like if you are thinking in in if you're thinking completely freely, if you have fluidity, you know, then uh, then then like opens your mind to new creative possibilities. So, like for example, I mean, this is this is just an example, and I'm sure there are things like this in other martial arts. So, like I'm not saying that Bruce Lee invented this, but the way he expressed it was sometimes he called his style the art of intercepting fists. You know, so like the two when someone throws a punch at you, you know, so the the instinct is to block it and then punch back, right? So the first move I ever heard from Bruce Lee, which again, like now this is like mainstream, but the first move I ever heard from Bruce Lee. Someone goes to punch you, you punch their arm as it is coming at you. You intercept it, you know? And like that kind of raw efficiency is like the hallmark of the Bruce Lee style, of like doing whatever, whatever works, you know? So the reason why I'm nervous to give this here is because like, it's like, how do you sum up what your Rebbe gave you, you know? And like, I, I'm saying like, like my whole teaching foundation was, was built on this. And what I did was, so, so what I'm gonna work from, I'm gonna tell you the plan for tonight. So there's a book he wrote, I guess the way I have to introduce this is like this. Uh, Johnny got me this tie from the Bruce Lee Museum oh, wow. in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, um, so this is his book on Jeet Kune Do. 
most of it is an actual martial arts book, but in the beginning he writes his, uh, he writes his philosophy. And um, I, I feel like initially we've talked about different styles of proverbs at certain times, you know, so there's like the American proverb, which is designed to like, boom, feed you an idea. Then there's the Shlomo Melf proverb, which is designed to be like that by working it out, you get other ideas and it's not clear, but like you work it out and get other ideas. There is a style of a Zen or Buddhist proverb and that's the style that he does. It's these individual sayings and um, there's a section that we're going to be reading, and there's a certain like um, there is a certain element of like Michelet proverb style where like it's indirect and you have to like think about it. There's a certain like like you know vagueness that's like intentional because it's supposed to spark your thought. So like not everything is going to be like a, uh, a a direct like rule or teaching, you know. But what I'm hoping is going to happen is like this. So so what I started to do, I started this project when I was doing my blog, is I I wanted to write uh, an article. A complete article on every line and I did two of them and I was like this is beyond me you know and like the two of them I think were very good but like I, I like I just there's so much to unpack and so many real world examples so like I kind of like put that project on pause and so what I'm hoping to do tonight is like this is we're going to read through we're obviously not going to get through the whole thing but as we read then I want to do um several things I want to try to explain it the best I can I want to hear your thoughts on how this might affect teaching or learning, because those are the two areas that I'm concentrated in, or approach to Judaism. Because what happened is once I started teaching and learning according to this approach, it affected my Judaism, you know? Um, and um, I, in fact, uh, I in fact got in trouble from some parents who wanted to fire me, not only because of this, but I quoted Harav Baruch Lee, and they felt that I was disrespecting the Masora, you know. Uh, but you know, I also for Abraham Lincoln, but they also didn't like that. But you know, so I don't think it was against Bruce Lee particularly, you know. But like, it really affected the way that I approach uh, Judaism, you know. And um, and so so I want to like explain it. I want to hear your thoughts on, it. and then also if anything that he says like relates to anything you've done in terms of like any craft that you've done, whether it's like music or like cooking or like sports or like whatever or coding, you know, like the more real world examples we get, then the more you'll understand what he's saying. And then once you see an example that's like across fields, then that allows you to like abstract from it and like apply it to other stuff. Okay, so we'll see where this goes. And my fear is that I'm not gonna do his, his memory justice, you know, but we'll see what happens. Like this could just be me, like just gushing about Bruce Lee and everyone has blank looks, you know? <laughs> that's my worst fear, but that, that's what we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, okay, so I think I only printed I feel like I have one more copy in my way. Oh, there's six people. That's enough. So here, take one pack down. And then uh, uh, who wants to use the book? Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Okay. So line one. So that's what he's going to talk about. So that his organized spirit is his diagnosis of the problem. Okay. The, the, the disease of the soul, as it were, okay? In the long history of martial arts, the instinct to follow and imitate seems to be inherent in most martial artists, instructors, and students alike. This is partly due to human tendency and partly because of the steep traditions behind multiple patterns of style. Consequently, to find a refreshing original master teacher is a rarity. The need for a pointer of the way echoes. Okay, now he, he's quoting Pointer of the Way. This is actually, a re I don't know what came first, but this is a reference to a line in one of his movies, another one of the philosophical lines. Again, I haven't seen the movie, but I just know the scene. So he's teaching this kid martial arts and there are a bunch of lessons he crams into it. And it's unfortunate because this is back when they like dubbed movies and stuff like it, like awkward to watch. But he, 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 he's, he's telling the kid uh, like how to actually learn. And so he, he points like that and he says, um, it's like a real teaching is like a finger pointing to the moon. Don't focus on the finger or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. Hmm. And the thing that a real teacher does is he points to the moon. He points to something. And then the student who's receptive sees what the teacher is pointing to and learn from that. Where the, the students who are, you know, uh, giving into this instinct to follow and imitate, focus on the finger. Yeah. Um, good example. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in Cody, there's um, I said like common problems and and just like what's called like programming patterns, which are like um, good solutions for like how to like deal with the problem. Yeah. But um, 
like knowing when to apply one of them and, and like like when you have the same problem and when you, and like it's not that like oh you have the same situation you can apply one of these programs when you have them because yeah. if, if you do then the program can end up like overly complex and right. not and, and like not doing what it needs to do yeah. um, and hard to maintain because um because they're because they, like, if you don't understand what the what it's doing and like what the ideas of it are and you're just explaining like oh i gotta do this thing then you're just gonna, it's just not gonna work okay right so i think that's part of the problem and that i would characterize as the difference initially between the chacham and the novel okay the chacham has particular ideas and then is focused on applying the particular ideas to scenarios that match it the novel realizes that there are underlying principles Behind these things, from which the Chachma is derived, and then seeks to approach things through the the Tibuna, yeah. Who is Bina? Yeah, right. I think what he's doing is similar to that, but I think what he's talking about is even further than that. And I'm going to use an example from Yeshiva. Okay, so um, Rabbi Tate is a pointer of the way. Okay, and uh, the way I know this is if you look at all of the Talmudim of the like the, the certainly the original Talmudim, um, you end up seeing that all of them went on and became their own type of independent thinker, you know? And there's a thing that Rabbi, so Rabbi Fox was my high school Rebbe, one of the original time I met him. And uh, every, you know, he writes this series every week called Thoughts on the Parsha. He's done this for, I guess, decades, you know? So I don't know if he still does this, but I mean, I used to get them in print when I was in Seattle. And on the last issue of every year, he would uh, have thank yous. And his thank you for, Reb, for, for Rabbi Chait was as follows, is this is always the last paragraph. I must acknowledge the influence of my teacher, Rabbi Israel Chait. For too few years, I had too few, like T-O-O, not too. For too few years, I had the remarkable good fortune to study under Rabbi Chait. Each year class was characterized by the Rosh Yeshiva's overwhelming love of, for Torah and learning. This love was expressed through a pure joy, which flowed from our teacher and filled the room. Okay, that's, that's just great. Okay, but that's not what I'm talking about. Rabbi Chait also encouraged us to grow in our own unique manner. Students have different strengths. Each must learn how to best apply his or her talents to Torah study. I hope that to some modest extent, I have succeeded in transmitting these messages to my own students. And when you, if, if you've known, if you have the, 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 you know, the, the <laughs> broad to know, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, top Talmudim of Yeshiva, they all have, and they're not just top Talmudim, I mean, it's, it's like, a, it's, you know, it, it's true to a, a large extent of like all of them, but like, they all have their own unique style, like their own interest, their own bent, their own strengths that they've developed. And like, that's what the yeshiva is trying to do is to not show you, I mean, obviously a lot here has to do with the particular Derek Halimud, but the goal is to like give you the tools to unlock your own relationship to Torah and your own unique style. Like, like I was just, I was just listening not, not that like whatever else. <laughs> not, not not that like I'm comparing the two people who I'm about to mention to you know the greats of yeshiva. I was I was while I was making dinner I was listening to Rabbi Zimmer's um, uh, Sunday year, you know, and he was talking about like midrash world, you know, and like if you've listened to that year, if you listen to Rabbi Zimmer, like that's midrash world, and then he talked about the Sunday year I gave, you know, and like I am drawn to pshat, and I'm drawn to the pshat rishonim. He's drawn to midrash, and he's drawn to the midrash rishonim. And like Yeshiva gave us the tools to like develop our according to our own strengths and in, intellectual like uh, intuitions and like you know and like it's just a that's what a real teacher does and like I know I got that from all my teachers in Yeshiva you know and like that's but what happens is you will always have people who give into the the, the instinct to follow and imitate and what they think that that the master is doing is the particulars and they just try to imitate the master you know and that's not what the master is doing you know the master had original insight and is doing his own thing as an expression of his original ideas and the the student who is looking at the heavenly glory instead of the finger will see that that's what the master is doing and he'll gain the tools from the master but then like you know but then apply them in his own way like ryan moskowitz will always say to us he was like my goal is to train your mind enough so that I give you all the tools to defeat me and then become your own like master, you know? Like, like that, was his, uh, that was his whole thing. And like, he used to say about Rabbi Fox, like Rabbi Fox is my, uh, I, I think he said these words, Rabbi Fox is my greatest product. Like, he's like, I taught him in high school 
then like he he took everything from me you know that i had to offer and he became like far greater than i could be and like that that was his like you know but that was like rabbi moskowitz's ambition and like and rabbi fox took to that and didn't just imitate rabbi moskowitz you know and that's like that's how to be a real student with a real teacher yeah i think um, i've had a really example of like of the of the opposite sure yeah is, um, okay <laughs> I, like, I think i think we're talking about like the sense about like what the group could ever is. right yes and, yeah like um people want to try to like define exactly what the what the derrick is yeah um and then like like apply like like have like you know like a strict definition of it and, right and yeah. So let's actually read the second paragraph. The second paragraph talks more directly to that. Okay, so he says, each man belongs to a style which claims to possess truth to the exclusion of all other styles. <laughs> okay, so that was, again, he's talking about martial arts, but he could easily be talking about Derek Halimud. He could be talking, yeah. IFS. IFS, exactly, right? He could be talking about to anything wolves, Whoa. you know, right? Yeah, like, I, you know, we understand the wolves. We biologists right. understand the wolves, you know, and like no one else does, you know. Um, these styles become institutes with their explanations of the way, dissecting and isolating the harmony of firmness and gentleness, establishing rhythmic forms as the particular state of their techniques. So that's Brisco Derek, right? So the most egregious form of this, I know I've told this anecdote many times this year, uh, was the uh, the young yeshiva Bukharim that I walked in upon in the base midrash one day with their list of Brisco Chakiras, mm -hmm. and they were learning Bukharusa, and they were looking to the and they were like, is this Kapsagavra? No. Is this like, you know, kind of, yeah, and like they were like trying to match them. That's the most egregious form, right? But like less egregious forms and less obvious forms are, you know, only this comment of the Rav knew the Brisker Dara. No one else has the Dara, you know? Like, we have the Dara, <laughs> right? But like if you look at the comment of the Rav, like if you look at like Rav Schechter, Rav Reifman, Rabbi Chait, like, you know, R uh, Rabbi Ganat, like all of them have, a uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein, you know, like all of them have elements of what the master taught them and like they have their own unique style and like and each one has its own advantages and disadvantages you know uh i don't even know if that's the right term to use advantages and disadvantages each one is coming from its own perspective you know and it has its own like like you know um yeah maybe maybe the best term their benefits and, and and limitations i don't know like you know um and uh and and the, the problem is in the 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 problem is foremost in the the belief that you have the only way, and then the attempt to take that way and then dissect it into its parts and then just rigidly apply the parts, which sounds like what you were talking about earlier with the coding thing, you know? And like, that's just not how thinking works, you know? Not really those rules, like very reductionist. Reductionist, that's the word, yeah, yeah, that's exactly the word. It's a reductionist uh, approach, right. you know? Is that like, um, so I don't know, because Elu, 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 Kim to me, the way it's used is more about particular ideas mm -hmm. I've never seen that used about Darfi Halima. Now it's possible, mm. and I, I want to say it never, I mean in Chazal. But there are, there is like, base hill, which I like to. Right, so the, well, that's the question, is that are those two Darfi Halimud or did they have the same Darfi Halimud and it was, uh, and and they reached different conclusions or was it like, let's say for example, like Hill and Shammai only have like, how many Mahalogism? Three. Three, yeah, I think, right? Or four. Okay, yeah, right. So like. They seem to have had the same dera. So presumably, they taught their students the same that dera. But what Mishi Rabu Hadeos something? No, it's Mishi Rabu um me Shabbat Hillel Shabbat Shulchan Kol Kolka. Right. So they didn't derive as much benefit as they could from their rabbim. You know, whatever you say, Shimshu, you know, Kol Sarfan. And then that, like, so in other words, like, it sounds like it wasn't too drafting. It sounds like it was too incomplete. Um. Manifestations of the Dara, uh -huh. you know. Now that might be the, uh, the, a similar thing. Like maybe that was them trying to like dissect their Rebbe's Derek and then they did it in different ways, you know. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's possible that what you're saying is is, okay. is is true. I just don't. I don't know for sure how that phrase is used. Yeah. Yeah. Could you flesh out that Hebrew term? Uh, these and these are the words of the living God, which we tend to use in halakhic matters to say that if you have Mahlos, Hill, and Bishamai, both positions are like legitimate halakhic positions, mm -hmm. uh, but we only pass them like one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's like an example of it. Is sure. Like, you know, you see sometimes people in the gym who like, you can tell like they have like a, like a regimen, like they have like a plan. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them anything about their plan, like they, 
will not be able to answer with any sort of precision or copy. Right. So that's because basically what they did was they found someone else's plan and just copied it verbatim. Exactly. So they don't understand why they're doing anything they're doing. Yeah. Or the order. Right. Or, or anything about it. And they're just, and it might not even be working for them. Yeah. And anytime, if you ask them a question or you, you know, try to bring something to their attention, it's always like, they'll appeal to the authority. Like, yeah. Oh, I got from this guy. And right. This guy is big and muscular. It's like. Yeah. You know, right. So that, that reminds me of the example in the Ramam and Shmona Prakim when he's talking about what the Hasidim, you know, would do, that they would do things that seem crazy, like rolling around in the snow or like, like, you know, um, uh, you know, like doing crazy things or like, like, like example comes to my mind, was there, is Rav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg would wear like tons of talitim, right? Like, like, or uh, tal 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 was it? Like oh, yeah, 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 right, you know, was it? Yeah, so you'd see like, like these people doing these things and you'd say, oh, those guys are pious. So I do that, I'll be pious, you know? And like, but you don't know why they're doing it. They're doing it for particular reasons, either based on ideas they see or based on what their own needs are, you know? And like, if you imitate them, I think I think it's the wrong who gives the example of it. It would be like if you saw someone sick, and then the doctor prescribes a certain medication. Eating coal or charcoal. Yeah, right. And 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 you're like, oh, that guy got healed, so I'm just gonna take the same medicine. You might have a completely different disease, and like this might make you like less healthy, you know. And I think that's why Bruce Lee in the first paragraph says this is partly due to human tendency and partly because of the steep traditions behind multiple patterns of style. Is what you're talking about is. There's a pattern and there's an eagerness to follow the pattern. But if there's a tradition to the pattern, then it has like the aura of like, it's old, you know, it's like authoritative, like, you know, and then and then that leads to even more, uh, you know, uh, uh, reverence for it, you know. And like thinking that it's guaranteed. Yeah, I think it's yeah, guaranteed, right, right, yeah. For sure, guaranteed. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now he explains the organized despair, okay? Number three, I should have numbered these, whatever. <laughs> Instead of facing combat in its suchness, then most systems of martial art accumulate a fancy mess. So that's another term for organized despair uh, that distorts and cramps their practitioners and distracts them from the actual reality of combat, which is simple and direct. Instead of going immediately to the heart of things, flowery forms, organized despair and artificial techniques are ritualistically practiced to, to simulate actual combat. Thus, instead of being in combat, these practitioners are doing something about combat. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is what I faced in graduate school for teaching. Okay, so, oh, so this is the thing. So I, I, when I said I, I, I thanked Bruce Lee uh, in my, my, uh, in my, my uh, grad, uh, grad school valedictorian speech, I, I, I said I have two, two people who taught me how to teach. One is Rabbi Dr. Chaim Foreman, all of a shalom, was, who was my mentor in YU, and then the other one was Bruce Lee. So Rabbi Foreman uh, taught all the basic courses. And uh, he was a Bruce Lee-like instructor. So he taught, um, I, I, there were two, I don't remember the guys, I think it was uh, Madeline Hunter and Robert Morgano. Those were the two like educational theorists who were in vogue back then, you know? So it was like how to make lesson plans, like how to do classroom management, like how to like do tests and stuff like that, you know? So he taught them and he was teaching the basic stuff, you know? And like I had other teachers who were teaching like other like, like methods and stuff, you know? So I was already like hardcore into Bruce Lee at the time, you know? And I was like, I, I don't think this works and I want to do something else, you know? And he encouraged me to do that and to think outside of the box and like to pull a Bruce Lee with all the stuff I was learning and then like break out of that in order to apply stuff. Because I saw that like you were, people were taking like these, like, like here's a dumb example. I don't know if any of your teachers, did any of your teachers at the beginning of their lessons write the objectives on the board? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right? So. I think that can be a very effective tool. And in fact, I've done that in Sunday Shirin, you know, but I think that if you're applying it the way you said, which is just as this mindless, like I'm gonna write like the objectives and then we're gonna talk about the objectives. It totally depends on the student and on the class, on the subject and whether it's your style or not. Like many times what I wanted to do, and this is kind of my style is like, like do something that naturally like shocks the kid. Mm -hmm or like naturally like awakens their interests or their hostility or their questions. And then the objectives emerge from that. And there's something powerful about the objectives emerging from the lesson where they're like, oh, like that's what's going on. As opposed to oh, here's what we're going to learn today. Like we gotta make sure to check off these boxes, you know? Like, and like, and the, the, the way that they taught it in graduate school was like, like this is how, you, this is how you're an effective teacher, you know? But it's what, it, and that's what it means. Like artificial techniques are ritualistically practiced to simulate actual combat. Real combat is faith in combat in its suchness. Like these are a bunch of like 
animalistic 10th grade boys that can't sit still, you know? And like, like, what do you do then? You're not gonna list objectives. You know, you're not gonna like cram them into like, like and they all these like systems of like, like, like disciplinary infraction things that I, I, I like use in my first month of teaching because like that was all I knew how to do, you know? And like, it's just like every situation in, just like every situation in combat is you're facing a live opponent doing things that like, might be fit into patterns that you know, but it might just be cold, totally unpredictable. And like the terrain, it might be rainy outside, you might slip, you know? Same thing in the classroom. Like it might be that they're in a bad mood that day. And like, you have to like, like, you know, I remember one day, one day there was a, a, a kid in, in high school who, I mean, this beloved kid who died and, uh, and like they still had school that day. And like the kids were very like uh, upset and like Rabbi Moskowitz got up and I don't remember how he segued into this. Ryan Oskowitz is not a skinny fellow. Mm. He's happy, okay? And he was, he somehow got them talking about exercises and he was showing us all the stuff he did for exercises. And I was like, I'll go into the garden and like, I'll, I'll take my shovel and I'll dig and I'll dig. And, and everyone just started laughing and like, and he started leading this discussion about like exercise and like how ridiculous of a thing it is, but like, you know, and like, it just like, it was just like, it was not a prescribed thing. And he just like went with the mood in the room, you know? And like, you know, it's just like, uh, if you are so attached to your, your organized despair, you'll just impose that on the situations indiscriminately. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of IFS like a lot. Yeah. Where like, um, where like, uh, like, I don't know, I guess like you like have like these frequency notions about like how it's going to go. Yeah. Like, have some knowledge. Yeah. But then like, when you actually do it, like it's, you're just like encountering your like, right. Not, like, there's no, yeah. You're not encountering exiles and protectors. Right. And, like, it's just protectors. your psyche and it's suchness. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, an example of that in, uh, in uh, Derek Halimud. And I feel like I might have quoted this. No, I don't think I quoted it here. I think I quoted it at Lumda. So I remember when I was in Yeshiva, I was very big on methodology because that was like what my mouth was into, you know? And I remember there was, uh, whenever you have a mouth locus, okay, you're trying to do spar with mouth locus, you know? So the question is, which side do you start thinking about first? So I remember asking Rabbi Mann, and Rabbi Mann said, start working on the side that makes the most sense to you because your intuition is already going in that direction, which gives you a leg up and like you'll be able to like formulate the idea easier, you know? Then I have Rabbi Moskowitz and Rabbi Moskowitz says, think about the side that you don't understand because if your one side makes sense, it means that your intuition is locked in a certain pattern and you have to break out of that pattern. And then I asked Rebbe and Rebbe said, there's no method, <laughs> you know? And I was like, whoa, that's really good, you know? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and like, there's no rule. And, uh, and you know, and then that's like, that was like a, a, a most hostile, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to like, think about that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so then he goes on, next one. Yeah. Another example? Sure. Um, they say like with gun training, like a lot of people buy guns and then they think like, all right, I'm safe now. Gun. Right. But like nobody realizes you have to train using that gun. So then like at the right. best, people like will go to a range and like Ooh. they'll just shoot out a piece of paper like 10 yards away. Yeah. But like, well, what happens when the bad guy is moving? Right. He's just standing still. Yeah. Shoot it. Exactly. He's actually shooting back. And like the, the, the form of practice is just nothing to do with the actual reality of how a genuine gunfight would Yeah. Be yeah. So uh so two things. One is um one is the um uh, oh yeah, I just coined a phrase and I actually just coined this. The mistake is to think that the tool is the skill, right? It's like, just because you have the tool doesn't mean that you have the skill. And just because you see someone use the tool skillfully, there's a fantasy that the tool is the skill, you know? Um, the other thing I was going to say was that, uh, and I, I wish I knew sports well enough to, to like rattle off examples of this, <laughs> which I don't, but I feel like there are, um, there are successful athletes that did things in weird ways. And like they were mocked for doing it in weird ways, but like it was their way of doing it that was just effective. And they just did it and like ignored other stuff, you know? Like I remember I, the only example that comes to mind is there's a movie based on a true story called Moneyball written by Aaron Sorkin. Uh, and like there was some pitcher played by Chris Pratt in the movie that like pitched in this really weird like way and like no one wanted to hire him because of that, you know? Um, and like, but like the Brad Pitt's character who was like hiring people based on like their actual like stats was like, okay, this guy does it in a weird way. Like, we don't care what the thing looks like. We care about like efficiency, you know, like that's it, you know, or to use a lesser example of someone who's not athletic. <laughs> so this is a dumb example, but I, 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 you know, I don't do so many physical activities. It's like, this is like the most recent example of this. So two years ago when I was in Hawaii, 
then Johnny and my mom wanted to go axe throwing, you know, and I'd never been axe throwing before. This is the thing that Johnny does a lot, you know. So we went to an axe throwing range and like guitar's two techniques for how to do it, you know. And I was just missing, like I was just not doing it well, you know. And then I found this weird technique <laughs> where you hold the axe. I call it the Iron Man. You know how Iron Man does this, you know, yeah. like to shoot? You take it and you go like this. And if you pretend you're Iron Man and aim with your palm, mm -hmm. it gets like in the bullseye. And like, I did this and it was just this weird way. And like the, the instructor was like, oh, like I've never seen anyone do it like that before. But I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's fine. And, and the thing is, is like, this does not mean ignoring techniques. Like obviously if techniques work, then they work for a reason for somebody. And so you should learn all you can from the technique, but you know, it shouldn't just like throw everything away and reinvent the wheel, but it's just not being locked into the techniques is the key, you know? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, so, all right, next, so, uh, yeah. Um, what does he mean by organized despair? What he means is that, uh, so I don't know why I use the word despair. Yeah. I, I, I always got read it as that like, it makes him feel a feeling, feeling of despair for the fact that this is what they think martial arts is. Because I don't think the people who are doing it despair unless it means that they're not successful, you know? But it's organized in the sense that like, like they are just taking things that, that came from a dynamic aliveness of combat and then, and then like freezing them and then trying to apply the frozen versions of them to like simulate combat. Okay, work still, super mental power and spiritual with this and spiritual with that are desperately incorporated until these practitioners drift further and further into mystery and abstraction. All such things are futile attempts to arrest and fix the ever-changing movements in combat and to dissect and analyze them like a corpse. Okay, so that's referring to mysticism, which was big in the martial arts world um, of like the secret master has his secret moves. Or like if you like get in touch with like a thing, then you can like control the elemental forces, you know? And uh, and I'm sure we can come up with examples of where that applies in Judaism, you know, of like, like not in our circles, you know, so much, uh, I don't think. I don't think, was it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we escaped that particular malady, you know, but like, but like in, in, in appeal, uh, like a, an appeal to mystery, that's a fallacy, you know, of like thinking that if you tap into a certain like mystical force, then that will give you like some supercharged intuition to find stuff, or like that'll give you some like guarantee of success or like schoolas or, you know, and that got into martial arts and like that, that's not even tied to like the actual interaction with the world. That's all in your imagination. Yeah. A couple weeks ago, yeah, I walked into a little convenience store on Saturday night, and I saw a guy who, like, I went to the a few summers ago, and um, they were saying this stuff to him, and it's just like during tear, you know, yeah, everybody's got like a positive beard, going yeah, on. and he's like, wow, nice beard, and I didn't have a nice beard, yeah, it, it wasn't, it was like all on my neck, not on my face, yeah, he's like, nice beard. I was like, are you really saying that, or like, <laughs> can you do that? Like, I don't care. yeah, he's like. Like, oh, I think it's, it's it's more than I have, and I feel like if I compliment people on their beards, it'll help me get a better beard oh, myself. Good stuff. Wow. Like, wow. Okay. Okay. That's that's messed up, man. But uh, <laughs> I was thinking of another beard example when we started talking. I remember Rabbi Hirschman was telling me that you know, as a hockey coach, I guess there's some superstition about I don't know if it's some time of the year or in general, like facial hair and like success in like. Like very towards yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Not yeah, or like people do all the all things like jerseys, like yeah. like wearing like wearing little bit soft. Yeah, right. Like it's like it I think sports like particularly. Yeah, it lends itself to that, right? Because you win and then you attribute it to like mm -hmm. particular like all your you know yeah. insecurities and stuff. Whereas like in learning it's not so tangible, you know. Like you're not like, you give a good swara and like you get the approval of your rebbe and you're like, oh what shirt was I wearing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I don't think it works like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I actually learned the last Last semester, um, in like in the very last month. Yeah. So, where are you in? Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, wherever. I was. Yeah. In, in that class, um, they were talking about um, like a sports that I like baseball particularly. Yeah. People in like I think in the outfield or whatever, or maybe in the East, wherever. One of the that's one way both of those yeah, right. to me, yeah. Whichever like spot had like the least control, yeah, the game, was like more likely, yeah, okay, and so, yeah, like more likely to uh, you know, do, like resort to like interesting. So, the less control you have, then yeah. the more, yeah, and, yeah, and I guess in sports, you there's a it's apparent that you have less control, yeah. Okay, uh, when you get down to it, real combat is not fixed and is very much alive. The fancy mess, a form of paralysis, solidifies and conditions what was once fluid. And when you look at it realistically, 
It is nothing but a blind devotion to the systematic uselessness of practicing routines or stunts that lead nowhere. What was that? Yeah, he is. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if this is a new point. You see a new point here? I feel like it's a summary of what he said before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think just like just to clarify, like sure. it seems like the mistake that he's pointing out is like not treating the activity like an actual activity in the real world. Right. But just like as this sort of like you know, like doing these like doing these things will just I don't know, points really give you this good result. Yeah. Like you're not looking at it as like there's actually this process going on. Right. So I'll, I'll tell you an example of that is as a writing teacher uh who was teaching the AP English. So like I'm getting them after they've been through all of the other English classes from like grade school and up, you know. I noticed I mean, it happens a lot in English, but the most the, the, the most blatant example was the way that students write conclusions, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't know why, maybe because those don't get like much attention. And I'm like, I would like be puzzled. I was like, what are you trying to do in this conclusion? And it's like they were, it's almost like they were taught like a dance move that like, I just got to like say these things. And the, when I asked them like, what function does this serve? There was just like a blank. It, was, it wasn't even like they were thinking functions. And I think that's because like, they know they're doing something when they do an intro. And they know that they're making arguments in the essay, but like they're taught that they have to have a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And like they just like like do something, you know? Yeah. And there's just no semblance of no sense of like what they're really telling myself to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like it, 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 you're right. It's like the uh, it, it's like, and that's what he means like the artificial practicing and stuff. And you gotta be like, uh, who's done martial arts? Do you have katas? Yeah. Yeah, right. So a kata. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, right. That's the flowery form. So, so kata is almost like a dance in the sense that you're doing a fixed routine of patterns, not against real opponents, and like, it's supposed to simulate real combat, and theoretically is supposed to prepare you for real combat. Bruthie was not uh, not into katas. In fact, he called it land swimming, which was like, <laughs> you know, you try to like learn how to train in, uh, as a swimmer, and you just like stand and just like go like that. Like, it's just not not actually like in the water and not actually in the thing. So all of his training, I mean, I'm sure he, I mean, he did use like punching bags and stuff, but he said punching bags don't punch back. That was the thing, you know, but like his real training was in actual combat, you know, because that's the, uh, that's the real way to get, to get stuff. And that's why like also as a teacher, like, so half of my graduate school was before I started student teaching. And then the other half was after I taught, it's night and day. When you're, when you are in the, the trenches of a classroom, even though we were all students, but like when you're in a classroom in the position of a teacher and you're like faced with the students, the, the, the suchness of it like overwhelms you, you know? Uh, and the stench of his sensory voice, but you know, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, when real feeling occurs, such as anger or fear, can the stylist? Now, so stylist is not like hairstylist. That was like the person who's attached to style. Okay, can the stylist express himself with a classical method, or is he merely listening to his own screams and yells? Yeah. It just reminds me of uh, I think I might have said this in Shiro once. Yeah. Where like here, where there's sort of like a certain Kirsten Reddy who like would daven in like a certain way, and there's like a guy at the wedding. Would like would do like jokes and imitations. Like, yeah. Ask the Rebbe, like, can I imitate you at the wedding? Like, is yeah. that going to be okay? It's like, yeah, sure. So the guy was like doing the imitation, and like everybody was cracking up. He did the yeah. imitation. The Rebbe started crying. Yeah. And he got so bad. It's like, where are you finding this permission? He said, you have to do it. And then he goes, when you were imitating me, I realized that most of the time that I'm dominating, I'm just imitating myself. Oh, uh, yeah. I do remember you saying that. That's a good story, the good application. And that shows how powerful it is that you become enamored by your own style, you know? And that's why, like, the, um, Okay, so two examples of this. Two examples. So the true greats, actually three examples. I'll give an IFS example also. Um, the true greats are always evolving. Okay, so three examples. Example one is Rabbi Moskowitz. Okay, and um, big surprise. <laughs> Rabbi Moskowitz, every, so I learned Mishle with him from 2001 uh, until let's say 2019, you know, and like he was constantly evolving his Dara Halimud. It was constantly changing, not just the ideas, but the way he approached Mishlei. Like, like when I first started learning with him, it would be the Patuk, every word had a meaning and we'd be Rubin and Yona, you know? Then we switched to the approach of no Mepharshim, you know? Then we switched to the approach of, of no Mepharshim and then looking at specific Mepharshim. Then we switched to the approach of like clusters of Pesukim. Then we switched to, you know, it was, it was, you know, then we switched to the approach of no questions, you know? And it was, it was like, 
like like just pure intuition, you know? So it was just, it was constantly evolving. That's example one. Example number two is one of my favorite, the, the classical composer who got me into classical music was Igor Stravinsky. And if you listen to all of his works from the beginning to the end, you would not know that it's the same composer. And I'm sure there are other music, you know, like musical artists who were constantly evolving and reinventing themselves, you know? Um, but like, that's another thing, like that they're, they're, they're not falling into that trap, you know? And the third example happened to me today uh, is in the IFS community group on Facebook, I was mentioning Schwartz's critiques of early and one of the Talmudian of Schwartz said, I'm, I'm in a session, I'm in a training course with him now. And he's, he, he like is uh, changing on his view of like what you can and can't do with exile. And it refreshes me to see that he's constantly evolving in this theories. Freud is another example that his theories evolved throughout the entire thing. You know, like you're not falling, you're not becoming entombed in your own stereotyped style, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of the thing, the, the row thing that you mentioned the other day, but, um, but he, is, he didn't want to like hear what he said. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he didn't want to hear his old smarts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know, um, it's my, it reminds me of when that happened to Helen. Yeah. I mean, I know it hadn't, like, I knew, like he hasn't like, done so much to Helen's work, but there's less, there's been less time for like that in French style, yeah. but um, we were thinking of like, of, like there being a single pivot point. Right. And then we can hear from where we're like, right. there's multiple pivot points. So yeah. Like, and, and it's a balance because there is such a thing as Pachma, <laughs> meaning in any area you, you learn, there are underlying principles. So you are, your mind, when your mind is trying to look for stable underlying principles, that's a good habit. But your mind is also evolving, which means that you're going to see deeper Pachma or different principles or mistakes you made. So it's, it's, it's a dance between looking for the stable underlying reality and being fluid enough to change. That's so being water, like like is, is 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 adapting to whatever the situation is and like flow, following the flow. Yeah. yeah is it like a mix of, um, what I think it's sort of, um, the process of like maybe seeing like a data point that, that doesn't go with your with it, and then like another second and a third, and at that point you change you like change the boundaries to incorporate incorporate that. Yeah. And, right. Um, and then they have a new like, boundary of like, of like what the principle is. Yeah. Um. And then if there's like more than, you know, you then your bias again. Right. Uh, yep. Okay. Stylists, instead of looking directly into the facts, cling to forms, theories, and go on entangling themselves further and further. You Finally, read, oh, did I skip one? Yeah. Oh, we didn't. You're right. Yeah, right, right. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. No, no. no I was like, I'm glad you freaked out. When real feeling occurs, such as anger or fear, can the stylist express himself with the classical method, or is he merely listening to both screams and yells? Now I see why you freaked out. That's good. Yeah. Is he a living, expressive human being, or merely a patternized mechanical robot? Is he an entity capable of flowing with external circumstances, or is he resisting with his set of chosen patterns? Is his chosen pattern forming a screen between him and the opponent and preventing a total and fresh relationship? So this is something that I don't understand. Okay, and, and this is gonna come across as a, a critique of other teachers uh, and like, look, they have their own methods. I never understood the teachers who could plan, the high school teachers, right? I mean, maybe it's different in different things, but I'm only speaking as a high school teacher who could plan out all of their lessons or even their curriculum in the summer mm. before they've gotten to know their students, mm. you know? Like, like, and then they rigidly stick to their lesson plans with their units and such, you know? Like, if you know your students, then, then maybe you can do that. But like, even then students change, but like, like I could never do that. And like, I would, you know, uh, you, you need to get to know those students and like the process of, formulating the hearing has to be in accordance with where they are right now. And you have to be a living, expressive human being thinking and not a paradigmized robot. And this is why, now I'm gonna say something which is based on my perception of, of uh, after being in Rafez actually for six years, I don't know if he's changed his, uh, his, his like um, his um, preparation since then. But when I was in his shear, what he would do is he would have his preparation of Habrusa and he would prepare everything with his Habrusa except the Svara, okay? And I remember this, and what he would do is he would, on the, in Shear, it was like, like Socrates compared um, arriving at truth to like a, a midwife, like assisting a birth, you know? Rapesov would like birth the idea in Shear, so you would watch it unfold in real time. <laughs> Sometimes it's a, it's a fancy mess, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, um, and I know this because we knew his chavrutas and his chavrutas would always ask us to tell 
uh, to tell them what the svara was because they never heard the svara, you know. And I remember seeing that, and like I don't, I've never asked for Pesach why he's done that, but I started doing that in my my classes, and like you know, with a high school class, you kind of do have to like prepare more ahead of time, you know. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I definitely started off copying him. Um, and I, it, I, the reason why I think it's not is because my whole personality goes against that. I don't know if you've noticed, but like, I'm a planner, you know? So I actually, was it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I actually had to work against, I had to do the, um, Hilvus Deus thing, um, is my personality wanted me to have everything planned out ahead of time and have all the ideas, uh, like locked and loaded, ready to go. And I actually had to practice the opposite approach and I emulated Repesach to free myself from that tendency, you know? And I had the, the added assistance of Rabbi Mockwitz who would, would like, you know, uh, think about it fresh, you know? So like that was a little bit of Lola's Ma. Um, but then I found that it made for better hearing because I would, I would uh, you know, be able to like, like the, the advantage of Repesach's method, one of the many advantages is the students who are watching get to see how a Svara forms. The students who are looking at the finger just wait till he's done thinking, and then they just try to get the last point, and then they miss the whole essence of her Pesach mm -hmm. year. The whole essence of her Pesach year is watching him come up with the Svara in iteration, 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 and then you go back, and when you do Hazara, which of course you're going to do, because otherwise, how can you become a, a Lamdin, you know, is you look, okay, he said it this way the first time. Why did he change it the second time? Why... I would have said it the first time. Why, why did he change the second time? What made him change it the third time? Why did he seem unhappy at the end of Sheer if it made so much sense? You know, when he tells us the next day to look back at it, like, like how are we supposed to know that that's something we shouldn't have been content with? It's watching the moves. And so the person who's just looking at the finger is just going to like doze off and space out and then like, okay, what did Rupesa say the Svara was? The essence of the Sheer is watching him like, think in real time. That's where you get the coaching. And that's why the people, that's why there are certain people who are frustrated with their face off here because they just want the silver platter version, you know, and that's not, that's not what a real thinker does. And like, Rokita could give a shear that way, you know, like there are people who just give like the punchline. And I'm not saying that that's a bad way of giving shear. Like that's just a different style, but the benefit of Rokita's style is you get to actually get trained in thinking, you know? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, stylists, instead of looking directly into the facts, cling to forms, theories, and go on entangling themselves further and further, finally putting themselves into an inextricable snare. Okay. What is that? Is that like, that sounds, what's that slippery slope? It sounds like it's... Yeah. So this is the problem that Ruf Pesach writes about in his uh, scientific, uh, halakhic, scientific, what, what's that? I think called? Yeah. Uh, I think so. Scientific method. Yeah, on, on scientific and halakhic thought. Let me just read this excerpt here. Um, so he's talking about the, um, the, the life cycle of a theory, okay, in, in science, but there's also in, in halakha and in everything else, right? So he says, um, uh, yeah, so breakthroughs, I, I, you got to read the whole essay. If you haven't read this, you have to read this. Like, this is cool. I think this is a different one. Okay. I mean, he talked about that subject, but I don't think he talked about it in those terms. The what? Oh. Svara Tom definition. Oh. Can you send me that? Because I actually don't have a copy of that. I think I Okay, yeah. So he says, breakthroughs are those theories that shift our thinking from the entrenched philosophy to a new one. Oh, hold on. Am I sharing this? Am I sharing the whole screen? No, I'm not. Hold on. Um, yeah. Um, this opens up a new approaches to analyzing phenomena, avenues of inquiry previously unrealized and indicates experiments not previously contemplated. Uh, it suggests new ways of looking at things and the unification of phenomena formerly regarded as distinct. It is a gate of knowledge and opening to formerly hidden vistas and perspectives and the beginning of a new intellectual environment. At the heart of the breakthrough is the ability to look at events or phenomena that present problems under the prevailing view and recognize the possibility that another view might make things yet simpler. So this is Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Of the paragraph, the breakthroughs are those theories that shift our thinking from the entrenched philosophy to a new one. Okay, um, okay. Thus, we move from a particular case or set of problems to a breakthrough, which in turn leads to new understanding about 
other particular cases, and eventually to new philosophy. And then he quotes uh, from, I think, Einstein, successful revolt against the accepted view results in unexpected and completely different developments, becoming a source of new philosophical aspects. This continues until problems reveal an inadequacy in the new philosophy and the process repeats. Now, this next paragraph is what Bruce Lee is talking about. Something interesting occurs at near the end of a philosophical regime. The idea that was once an intellectual boon to science at its inception, allowing for new freedoms of thought, can become in its decline an intellectual shackle, forcing every phenomenon to conform to its terms. For the conventional thinkers, it is no longer a tool of new insights and fresh ideas. Rather, it becomes an ideology of its own. The loyal rally around it and craft creative, if not brilliant, ways of fitting the unruly phenomena into the old terms, no matter how tenuous or far-fetched. Ironically, this is the opposite approach of the methodology that spawned the very new idea they are defending. Whereas the original breakthrough started with a set of problems from which were derived a new universal, this method starts off with universal and insists on particular kinds of solutions which are in line with the philosophy. Eventually, a new breakthrough is needed to once again reduce the complexity created. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, brilliant. brilliant. And then now let's hear Bruce Lee again, who just said the same thing, but just in a much more zen way, right? Is he says, stylus, instead of looking directly into the fact, that's what Rebezo is calling the phenomena, cling to forms, theories, so that's the prevailing theories, and go on entangling themselves further and further, finally putting themselves into an inextricable snare where they can't actually solve anything because they're just trying to use the old theory and use it to solve all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? It's exactly the same phenomenon, you know? Same mistake, yeah. Um, so that's using your method as, the, as another manifestation of using your method as the only method. Uh -huh. So yeah, I guess it is slightly different that like, and maybe it's the same point, but Bruce Lee is talking about like methods of doing things mm -hmm. and we're based on some talking about like paradigm. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that is a, that is a difference. Yeah, I think it's the same um, type of entangling. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, of trying to solve old problems with new, trying to solve new problems with old solutions when you really need new solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they do not see it in its suchness because their indoctrination is crooked and twisted. Discipline must conform to the nature of things in their suchness. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a like, overused analogy, but like they're trying to fit a square, like a square peg to get into a round hole. Right. Like no matter how much you, you like want to want this to fit into this hole, yeah, this is not gonna work. Right. And I think what's like in like not Dan, yeah, dangerous, I guess, is like mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. like you could always, if the answers are creative enough. Yeah, fit it into yeah, paradigm. exactly. So and then that's just taking it all out and holding back knowledge, mm -hmm. you know. So, how do you, yeah, yeah, I guess it's like difficult to so oh. like know how do you like when it's actually you have to throw out. So, so, this is the Kiddush that I just saw in this line just now. Discipline must conform to the nature of things in their suchness. So, if you treat it as a Mishlai like there's the full discipline, Mutra Evelium. <laughs> I think that's actually what Sadiqon holds about that process now that yeah. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Musa Yvili Mivelis. There's a puzzle that's the second half of Musa Yvili Mivelis. And then there's the Chacham's discipline. So the, the, the fool's discipline thinks I have to stick to the rules no matter what. Mm. You know? But the Chacham's discipline is discipline must conform to the nature of things in their suchness. The Chacham's discipline is I must, I must be disciplined to constantly watch the phenomena and go where the phenomena take take me, you know? And that's where Pesach will always use the terms, there's a difference between a bottom-up approach and a, a top-down approach. Uh, a real scientist works from a bottom-up approach, letting the phenomena dictate what the theories are, as opposed to taking a theory and then and then like imposing it upon the phenomena. Yeah. The Kochum is making a similar mistake because the Kochum is also in, uh, cramming stuff onto, on, onto things. I guess the difference is that the, that the yeah, the Chacham and the Evil are similar in that sense. The difference is that the Chacham is doing it based on something that actually was an idea and could work in certain cases, whereas the Evil is doing it based on its own like emotional um, uh, thing. And why are they doing that similar? They're, they're both taking fixed ideas and then imposing them on reality without looking at whether it actually is going to work in this case. I will only just saying that the problem is like. So, Navon, because now pointing out that Navon is, uh, yeah, I was, I was being like locked up to like a thinker. I was saying like a thinker, but he's saying like oh. a Navon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maturity does not mean to become a captive of conceptualization, it is the realization of what lies in our innermost selves. Okay, the, the, this is something that is uh, a, a core fundamental of Bruce Lee, which I'm undecided about. Um, Bruce Lee is a big believer in the fact that you have to trust the self. 
um, and that the that the that the, that you know that the self uh, always. Uh, uh, hold on, Bruce Lee. Where's my phone? Mm -hmm. Oops, I don't want. Well, it opened my. It opened Bling. Why does Bling even exist? Bling or Bing, Bing. not Bling. <laughs> Bing. I don't even know what it was called. Yeah. Um, hold on. Um, I didn't even hear what you said. I get it. Yeah, I heard you said that. Yeah. Oh yeah. So th th this is the this is the clearest uh, um, version of the statement. Uh, always be yourself. Express yourself. Have faith in yourself. Do not go out and look for a successful personality and duplicate it. But there are lots of quotations like this where he 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 really maintains that like you have certain a certain uh, potential and certain strengths. And your goal is to actualize those in the most perfect form that you can. Um, and so um, that's what he's alluding to here. Um, how far you take that and whether that's going to work in every area, like, like, I don't think if I try to actualize my baseball player self, then that's really going to like lead to actually like good baseball, you know? Maybe that's not yourself. Maybe it's not myself. Yeah, I guess that's I another question. Like, what's, yeah, right, right, right. right. That, 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 that's true, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that needs to be unpacked. When there's freedom from the mechanical from mechanical conditioning, that then there's simplicity. Life is a relationship to the whole. <clears throat> that you can't really get so much from what he's saying here. But um, uh, one of his things he always, is always warning against is uh, overcomplicating things. Um, and uh, and like he always says, um, my other thing quotes here. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Um, I was reading an article recently about how people have a tendency to try to solve problems by adding things, but um, people have a hard time solving problems by taking away things. It is not daily increase, but daily decrease. Hack away at the unessential, hmm. right? So the, what? You heard this. That was his mom. That was right. Yeah. Like, yeah. That was Same DNA. Yeah. I was like, I Yeah, maybe you told your mom when you were there. No, my mom said it told me that. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, yeah, right. But yeah, yeah. It's it, it's people think that by uh, was wait. Did I hear something similar from your mom also? With the bicycle. Was there yeah. features of uh of software? Yeah. There was a time right a few years ago where I was talking about. That. No, okay. So I was thinking about this year. Oh, but, but, but that's a different I'll example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an example on. I'm almost positive it was your mother's electronics that um. So kids learn how to like ride a bike by having a bike with training wheels. Yeah. yeah. And like yes, I heard the training wheels. <laughs> say it again, say it again. Like, it doesn't actually help them learn to ride a bike because like they can do that for however much time and then they get on a bike with no training wheels. They don't know how to balance. They've never right. learned how to balance and like they just can't ride the bike. Yeah. Like, it's like a very hard thing to do. Yeah. And and um and Right, and so so usually people think that like the way to help them is to add something. Like, yeah, kid can't get on a bike. You got to add things. Uh -huh. That's what they're gonna learn. Right. But, like really, the way to solve the problem was they made a bike that didn't have training wheels and didn't have pedals. Yeah. And it was essentially a scooter that you sit on and you use your feet. But what they had to do is the kid would like kick off with his feet and then balance for a second yeah. and again and again and again. Right. And the kid would learn how to balance and then he can get a bike with pedals that's a little bigger with his feet off the ground and right. he could, and he could bike. Yeah. And nobody thought that like if we remove the training wheels and the pedals, then maybe it'll, like it was just like yeah. add on to help the kids. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. My younger brother wouldn't be like my training wheels. And he would ride out. I grew up on a dead end, like a big five foot sack, and he would you know slide around the street. And then like we noticed at some point he would just be out riding his bike by himself, just like whipping around the street, like going super fast, like taking sharp turns. And like like I noticed my mom noticed like at individual like separate points that like he was riding the training wheels were totally just elevated oh. <laughs> he literally wasn't using them yeah yeah and then i think my mom just took them off one day he's like why don't you take off my training wheels? Yeah. Like, you don't need them he's like yeah i do he's like no no watch and he just went out and yeah because like, he wasn't even using them right well this is an example of how clearly lots of people have learned to ride bikes from training wheels right. right that's like undeniable right that's like factual right but at the same time there could be more efficient ways to do it. And if you look for simplicity, then that will all, oftentimes be a good way to look. And really the example I gave before of the intercepting fist is a good example of that. Instead of blocking, recovering, and then striking back, you punch the guy's fist 
which is a simultaneous defense and offense, you know, in, in, in one shot, you know, that simplicity, yeah. I have a counter counter. Ooh. Yeah. So I was, so I started off running by the training angle. And when, like, when I started learning how to like, vacuum, it, like, it took me a, like, a long time. It used to, you know, I've been riding by the training angle for a while because, like, it, it wasn't, like, a good, like, it, to, okay, to some extent, it, it, it's similar to riding, to riding bikes without training wheels, but to, to a large extent, it's not. And that's, that's I think, the issue, I think. Yeah, I'm going to count on Okay. One example on that we train for one point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's very yeah. good. It's yeah. Not always, yeah. Yeah. It's not like you always always do things. Right, right, right. Yeah. Good, good point. Uh, the man who is clear and simple does not choose what is, is. Action based on, I, on an idea is obviously the action of choice, and such action is not liberating. On the contrary, it creates further resistance, further conflict. Assume pliable awareness. Now, this is just another aspect of the problem of instead of relating to the ever-changing reality, you are interacting with the reality through an idea. And once you're doing that, first of all, it's an intervening step where you're like, instead of just reacting to reality, you're like, okay, what category does this go into? Oh, that category, so now I apply this technique. You know, so it's an intervening step, so it's not, it's not simple. Secondly, is it's gonna miss, it's gonna be a shield that's gonna blind you to the particulars of that situation. So for example, if you go into a character to Helen and you're like, I have to find a pivot point that is halfway through, as opposed to, okay, I have this idea of pivot points, which should be on my mind, but what what do we do when we read a character to Helen? What are your impressions? Like what hits you, you know, of like that strikes you and then you follow that, you know. Your, your, your goal is to be reacting to the thing. Now, what makes a chafan, or a navon, I should say, what makes a navon is the navon's intuition is better. So his intuition and his choiceless um, uh, actions are going to be oftentimes more on target than the layperson's, you know? Um, so that does get better the more skilled you get. But, but he's stating the ideal here, which is to not do stuff, stuff through screens of artificial patterns and ideas, yeah. Uh, there is a certain usefulness, though, in not having, having a filter. So yeah. Person. You can't be analyzing every single piece of data fresh, you know, throughout oh. the entire life. It's not very efficient to work Right. But he's actually, his thing is a key in that. He's saying you shouldn't analyze uh, when you're in the actual situation. You should. You should not analyze. It's, the past, uh, is, you, you let, your, let your tools, uh, let your tools strike. Meaning like, like if you've trained well, then you will do whatever your training dictates automatically without thinking. So this is the Rabbi Mosk, I, I know I've said this before also, this is the Rabbi Moskowitz example of the acrobat on the airplane. So like you saw this, this uh, video once, like you can see this if you look at like black and white like footage. The, you know those planes with like the double wings, like propeller thing is like, like there's like- those planes. Yeah, this is like, like you could stand on the propellers, mm -hmm. you know? So there's like this acrobat who would like do tricks on the planes and stuff. It was like some daredevil thing, you know? So crazy stuff, you know? So like, right off, saw this interview, someone was interviewing this, this acrobat and said like, like, aren't you worried that you're gonna like, like what happens if something goes wrong? You know, so she said that like, what I do is when I'm on the ground, then I, I and I'm practicing, I think through in detail every single possible scenario that could go wrong. And I rehearse routines to account for that. And then when I'm up in the air, if I trained well enough, then if something goes wrong, I will not have to think, I'll just act. And my acting will have been molded by my preparation, you know? So there is a time for analysis. And just like, let's say like when Bruce Lee like is like figuring out how to punch, he's obviously figuring out what is the best position to have your hand in, you know, to punch. And he practices that a bunch of times, but then when he's in actual combat, you're not thinking. You're not like, okay, this is how I punch, you know? Uh, so in, in, in so so in this paragraph he's talking about combat and the analysis and the thinking comes in training right. yeah so that's where you should build up in training you should build up your intuition and you should be thinking and dissecting putting these in categories yeah um, so you are not limiting yourself to one style you are looking though for efficiency in the particular moves you know, like it, the analogy in science would be like, let's say like, mm, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but like, you're not only looking at things through one paradigm, but whatever facts you're observing, you're trying to get all the data on those facts, you know? Um, okay. Uh, are we okay doing a little bit more or are we like, yeah, it's eight, 10. Yeah,
Okay. All right. Uh, I, I want to go for 15 more minutes. So you, if you have to leave, you can leave. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and I want to end at 8.30. Um, really, oh, so I should probably respond that I'm going to be at Mark then. I wasn't sure how long this would go. Uh, unless there's already a meeting. Uh -huh. Oh, I mean, um, should I wait and be 10? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, oh, this is, okay, here we go. Uh, this might sound familiar from last Thursday. Relationship is understanding. It is a process of self-revelation. Relationship is the mirror in which you discover yourself. To be is to be related. Now let's compare that. And that's what we read from Kristen Murdy. Uh, surely the function of relationship is to reveal the state of one's whole being. Relationship is a process of self-revelation, of self-knowledge. Yeah. This self-revelation is painful, demanding constant adjustment, pliability of thought emotion, it is a painful struggle with parents of enlightened peace, and then, and so on, you know. So, so, yeah, what do you think he means by that? Which one? It's a good mirror. It's the mirror. Okay. Um, but not sure what they meant by relationship. So he's talking about relationship with another person. So to be clear. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking like in terms of like like when you're like trying to get like understand Shita and like you understand the other side. Oh, that's interesting. No, he is talking he is definitely he's talking about it. yeah, because he's talking about it in the context of uh, of combat. But this could apply to all relationships also, which is what Trishna Murray was talking about. That you see um through your interactions with others, you're seeing how you behave. Yes. And what you feel and what your thoughts are, you know, um, and that's that's the healthy way to go about being in a relationship and any relationship, right? It's like you are responding to the other person, and instead of just like focusing on looking at them through a filter of like what you want them to be or like what you know they are or what security you take in them, you are like using your interaction with them to learn about yourself, and because and, they observing your own deus. Or your own parts, yeah. Um, and it's it's constant like feedback to your yourself, you know. And just to <laughs> just to tie this in, I mean, again, like Rabbi Sachs was one who um, who introduced me to to Rambam in a non brisker way. He used to call. So actually, this is based on misunderstanding of Rabbi Sachs. It worked out. Is uh, we found out years later. That the Mishnah Torah is uh, is the, is is the mirror of the self. That by looking in the Mishnah Torah, the Mishnah Torah is that by that the the person who's not actually using mitzvot correctly is just looking at the mitzvot as things outside yourself to study. But the person who's looking at mitzvot correctly is viewing them as like a blueprint for for human perfection. And so when you're looking at the mitzvot, you're really using it as a mirror to look at yourself. And that's why David Melch says once you know all the mitzvot. And you like you know the reasons and how to implement. Then you won't be ashamed when you look at them. Like the shame is in seeing like there's a certain part of myself that I'm just not aware of or not aware how it should be developed or not aware like what where it's going. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say also part of this is um, when you are in a relationship with someone else, that brings out you. It brings out you a deeper understanding of yourself and to them through you they reach a deeper understanding of themselves yeah and then it's both people on the same page yeah group is both yeah are going down and then from that deeper point you're constantly just going deeper and deeper, and deeper exactly and then and the exact reverse happens is if you're doing the opposite of this surprise surprise that you only look at the other person in terms of how you want them to be so you're not actually looking inwards and asking where that comes from and they're doing the same to you and then you're you know um wild movie try even no, that's gonna be a tangent. Okay. Um, yeah. What was a misunderstanding? Uh, so apparently, and, and and maybe, okay, it's possible. So I, I, I heard the initial quote from Jake Adler, mm -hmm. and uh, Jake was a student of Rabbi Sachs in high school. Mm -hmm. And when we mentioned Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Sachs said that like the Rambam is a, he was saying it as a negative thing, that the Rambam is a mirror and everyone just sees their own views on the Rambam, you know? And that's the, that's the pun of, it's not your monodies, it's my monodies, you know? Like, like everyone projects their own views into, into the Rambam, you know? But I still think that the, 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 the misunderstanding is a true idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, so just yeah. Not, this idea is not limited to like relationships with people. It's just people can bring out, they are a 
way in which you bump up against. Right. For example, I'll give you another example: is tefillah should be a mirror mm -hmm. that you're seeing that like like you're you're seeing the same text every day in Shimon Asrei, right? But hopefully you're changing, right? And your circumstances are changing. So if every day you say and you're not looking at what is my relationship to knowledge today, then you're not actually being mispala. Because mispala means you're judging yourself and judging yourself means yourself right now, you know? So, so that's why people complain that I can't just make up all my own tefillos, but no, if you actually like think about that same phrase and you reflect on how do I relate to that today, What's my relationship to Chachma today? What needs do I have? What gratitude do I have to God for giving me Chachma? And then you use that as a mirror to examine yourself. That's actually, like, again, Lehi's Pala literally means to judge yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you're actually engaging in Lehi's Pala, you know? Right. Yeah. It reminds me of um, in Pali Syrian Yeah, right. Yeah. Syrian is another example, right? Like, how am I reacting to this? You know, like, I had, this is, I haven't decided whether there's going to be a Stoic podcast episode yet, but, like, I had an example where I was, oh, wait pet peeve of mine in driving. I hate it. First of all, I hate it when people don't use turn signals. Of course. The worst thing though, is when they don't use turn signals and they do the slow <laughs> turn, you know? So I was, this was in one thing of driving home, a person did the slow turn without the turn signal and I was annoyed, okay? Then there was another person in front of me who was just going like infinitely slow. And then I realized that it was an old lady, okay? And I was like, I feel annoyed, you know, but I was like, oh, it's an old day, you know, you know. And then I remember Jesse Fifine would get angry, not angry. She would get like frustrated at me. She would, she would, um, we would, used to teach 10th grade homework at the same time. So some days of school, we would both be driving at the same time. And I, I would drive this uh, at the speed limit on Branch Boulevard because they're always cops, you know. And, and, so fast. I know it's a long stretch, you know. Yeah, and uh, and she wouldn't, and then she said that she would often like get upset. Who's this guy driving the speed limit? And then it'd be me, you know. So the the juxtaposition of the three things, I was like, okay, the first time was someone not actually using the turn signal. Second time was someone who is old and like maybe she learned to drive in an, a slower world, you know, or maybe she's just not like maybe she's what how whatever reason old people drive. And then there's me following the law and not old, and and Jesse being annoyed. And I was like. I bet the annoyance is the same. And that should tell me something about the annoyance, that, that the annoyance is not really coming from any actual thing that has to do with the circumstances. It has to do with like my own feelings about like people who are perceived as like obstacles to my expression of uh, driving self, you know? So like that's an example of like, you know, like the assuming I love is the same afflictions befall you, but the person, the, what Hazar advocates advocating is you look inward and use it as a mirror for self-understanding, you know? And then you're never blaming the outside circumstances. You're always like looking at yourself and like working on yourself and that's like a healthier mentality, yeah. I'd like to request that comment. Okay, sure. Yeah. Coming right up. <laughs> Maybe we'll do, yeah. Uh, I just remembered I didn't record tomorrow. So I got to do, I got to do something for tomorrow. Maybe we'll do that for tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Forms are vain repetitions which offer an orderly and beautiful escape from self-knowledge <laughs> with an alive opponent. Oh, did I skip one? Oh, yeah, you're right. Set patterns incapable of adapt adaptability, of pliability, only offer a better cage. Truth is outside of all parameters. Okay, well, okay. Forms are vain repetitions which offer an orderly and beautiful escape from self-knowledge with an alive opponent. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a harsh one, mm -hmm. right? Is that people, not only do forms make you ineffective, but forms offer you an escape from self-knowledge because instead of actually looking at the ever-changing reality or the ever-changing relationship or the ever-changing historian and saying like, what, how am I responding? You just take security and like, oh, all I have to do is do this. And then like, I don't have to think about myself. I just like do the ritual or I do the form and I don't have to think about myself, you know? Yeah. Um, I have an example from that to the other. Yes. Um, so yeah, yeah. there are, um, so you can have certain strategies and have like certain like plans for how they like if you can have like deck the person some strategies for how they deal with other types of decks. So um there's a thing that people do sometimes, which is they they like print out like a plan for for like how they deal with certain types of matchups. And like because of the nature of magic gathering is that people can like like design the deck like however they want and so they can make changes that can totally invalidate their strategy. Um, 
the, the, if you are making decisions based on like your like your pre-printed plan, then you're just not going to be able to like adjust to the situation and do your thing. I think that's an example of his first thing. This is a new point, which is that forms are offer an escape from self-knowledge of not looking at yourself. And unless I'm just not hearing that aspect in what you're saying. I missed the self-knowledge. Yeah, yeah, the self-knowledge I think is the new point here. Yeah. Uh, but forms and means like set patterns. Set patterns, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Um, and I just just to clarify, like, and he, he's not again, he's not saying that like he's not saying techniques are are bad. Like there's such a thing as good technique and bad technique. It's the the organization of the techniques into a style and imposing on the reality. Like, again, like there are effective ways to punch. But again, even the technique can become a like sometimes you can't punch in the way that you're supposed to punch, and you have to like you can't even that can't be rigid. I'm just saying he's not denying that there are effective ways to do stuff in effective way. Like if Bruce Lee had like there is a default stance that he thinks is the most pliable, you know, but he would just not say that you do that in every case. Yeah. Um, it reminded me of I don't I'm not sure if this is exactly the rule, but it's reminding me of um like being a rework with the thought. Like where you get so fixated on like just doing the technical like right and yeah you sort of forget about like that you're actually trying to protect yourself <laughs> yeah that, that that's a good that's a that's a, a good point uh and that's an even further distortion where you lose the value system mm -hmm. meaning these guys who he's criticizing at least think that they're trying to fight and win right they're not doing it purely as dance you know yeah, yeah. um Accumulation is self-enclosing resistance and flowery techniques strengthen the resistance. Yeah. I'm sorry, sure. the previous one. Yeah. Who's the aligned opponent? Is that yourself? Oh, no, no, no. That's the opponent who you're actually uh, facing, who's like, who you're, you're fighting right now. I mean, when you have a lot of opponent, you gain self-knowledge. Um, if you, yes, you gain self-knowledge. You're self -knowledge. not holding yourself to a form. Yeah, if you're not holding yourself to a form. I Meaning if you're if you're only relating to this opponent through your forms, you're not getting self-knowledge. But if you, it's a live opponent, you are are constantly reacting to what they're doing and you're learning about yourself in that comment. There's a there's a story about Bruce Lee, which I actually don't know about Peck, because I, I read it recently. Um, I don't know all, all the details, but I guess one so when he was a, a in Hong Kong growing up, he was um like a troublemaker type like kid and he would like pick fights with people and stuff. He had like a lot of like angry energy. And, uh, and he got into a fight with someone. And I think maybe, I don't know if they picked a fight with him or whatever. He crushed the guy, like he, he totally won. And then he went back and he was so upset at himself because he, I, I think it was because he like made a bunch of dumb moves. Mm -hmm. So like he was the point, this is a story his daughter was telling. And like he, he was relating to the fight as an opportunity for self-knowledge, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like, and, and that was the like, you know, then that, that's what he's trying to do with the opponent. Yeah, you know? yeah. But isn't that isn't that relating to like then he's in, like he won the fight, so he did all the moves that he had to do. So what, who like because afterwards he's looking back and saying like, well, what did I learn about myself from that? And I just and he's realizing like he yeah he was acting normally in the fight like going with his natural instinct, but he's realizing now that like like things could have been done better, you know. But they were done efficiently. Like in the way, like that. Well, just because it won, just because you won, didn't mean that it was uh, the efficient way, you know? Yeah. Like in magic, this is very clear because you could win and just go back and watch. Like it's the most humbling experience if you watch yourself, if you watch a, a replay of a game that you did. Even if you won, you're like, I cannot believe I just missed this move. And like I could have lost. Like it could, you know, just because it worked out. It was a Michelin thing, right? Just because it worked out doesn't mean you made the right decisions. Um, Okay, uh, the classical man is just a bundle of routine ideas and tradition. When he acts, he is translating every living moment in terms of the old. Okay, so this is, I mean, I, I wrote a whole thing on this also, but like, this is the danger with mitzvot. Because mitzvot, you are relating to things through fixed halakha. But what mitzvot should be is a, like the Ramam thing, it should be a, a, a means of gaining self-knowledge. So if the only way you're relating to halakha is just like looking at what the halakha says and then implementing it, so then you're not actually uh, you're not actually using the mitzvahs for self knowledge and perfection, you know. But if you are, then you're just a bundle of routine ideas and tradition. But if you're using the mitzvahs as a as a way to like like you know um, uh, like gain knowledge of the self, mm -hmm. so then it becomes a living entity, even though you're using old structures. Yeah. Yeah. This reminds me of another thing I learned in Yeah. Which is that. Um, 
there were like a bunch of these like tribes or whatever in like uh I don't know, Australia or something. Yeah. And they would like basically they would they had like these um like totem that like each tribe had or Yeah. Um and when like and then like the and like it worked for a thousand years and yeah. everything sort of made sense and there were little changes that happened in culture but like they fitted into their totems yeah but then when like the europeans came and like everything changed the fire engine like yeah uh, <laughs> <they, uh, laughs> um like they had they basically like kept trying to fit things into their own into the like that the, their right forms. and like even okay yeah and even before the europeans i don't know why i didn't drop it up but like the um like there was like one um like plan that like they would not use canoes because uh -huh. like their ancestors didn't use uh, they would right. use, like they would just like fit like whatever they would like swim in the water yeah they wouldn't use canoes even though like the clan up the river like had oh like used um, yeah canoes. they just wouldn't use canoes right was, so um, let, let's let's extend that into learning yeah. right is that i think that it is a mistake to view their halimud as we're only using the tools that were available to that they're like classical tools, you know, like there is such a thing as Chiddush even in Derek Halima, like Rav Chaim was Machaj the Brisker Derek, like there, like there are, you know, like Berman is like, you know, um, like, you know, is is using like a different, the, the knowledge that we have available to us now of history and archaeology, you know, like there are, you know, Rav Perch, Shadal, Malbim have their own like unique methods. And so if you just like limit yourself to what was, obviously if you neglect what was used, in the past, then that's just done. Like then you're not learning from the actual greats. But if you limit yourself to that, then that's just like the canoes, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's read one more and then we'll call it Christmas night. Knowledge is fixed in time, whereas knowing is continual. Mm -hmm. Knowledge comes from a source, from an accumulation, from a conclusion, while knowing is a movement. So that's the thing that that's whenever you see um any like <laughs> sometimes if you read anything from Eastern philosophies, it could seem like they're anti-knowledge. And maybe some of them are, <laughs> but in Bruce Lee, he's anti-static ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, he he was a knowledge seeker. You know, uh, but he but the the goal is to always be knowing and 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 constantly questioning and revising your views and like gaining knowledge from wherever it is. You know, um, but if you just like hold on to these ideas and like and then they, that's just another form of this thing of like, just plugging in the ideas or like view, viewing these ideas as the only truth and that's just you know the static thing. All we have is models. All we have is models. Yeah, you got to just keep on updating them. And 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 again, that's like gets back to his his physical muscle that he uses all the time is, is water. You know, of like flowing like water and adapting and 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 you know going wherever uh, wherever the, um, the 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 situation the living ever living situation demands. You know, um, and uh, yeah. So I hope again, this is just like a little bit of it, but. I hope the, the title of this year was a glimpse into how Bruce Lee affected uh, or impacted my methodology of, of teaching and learning. I hope you can see like how much, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this in, in what I teach and learn, <laughs> but in terms of like the richness of this worldview, uh, then like you can appreciate like how much I owe to, to, to him and like, and you know, and, and this is why I meant like the, the impetus for this year now is like, it's near the end of the year and I always like burn out at the end of the year. And, um, and like, whenever you find yourself in a rut, then going back to your basics or your foundations is a good way to get started. And like, I had not read Organized Despair inside in a very long time. And like, just going through this, it's just reminding me of like, to get that sense of like freshness and like, you know, like jumpstarting the fluidity again, you know, and like, I think that's a, it's a healthy thing. So, all right. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, and I have a request for you. Um, can you 